Let's turn now in our Bibles to Job chapter 1. We'll take as our text of Scripture tonight on the occasion of baptism, verse 5 of the chapter, but we'll read all of the verses here. Job chapter 1, this is the Word of God. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, There came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. 
There's where our reading of the Word of God ends today. Let's reread verse 5, which is our text. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, if I asked you, what is the first thing that you think of when I say Job? You would probably say, a man who endured suffering that I can't even imagine, but also a God who is sovereign over suffering. And that's probably what most of us would answer if we say, what is Job about? But something that is not as familiar to us is a little gem in chapter 1 before the crisis even hits, before all these things befall this man of God, we have this diamond, our text, verse 5 which says something about what Job was like before the trial even hit. And we're going to apply that too. There's some rich application there. A man who's a leader in his family, who takes his leadership responsibility with his children seriously, and a man who is deeply concerned for the souls of the children in his family. What an appropriate word, not only for us as a whole, as a church, in as much as we're members of the church here and there are the children of the church, but how appropriate, especially for fathers here. And so much application on this occasion of baptism. As far as who Job is, You might be surprised by this because it does come a little bit later in the Old Testament. The book itself does. Job, though, actually lived during the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, probably during the time of Abraham. So he does live a little bit earlier on in Old Testament history. As I said, probably a contemporary of Abraham. A very godly man. And that's what's going to come out in the preaching of this text tonight. Let's consider this under the theme Job as priest in his family. Job as priest in his family. In the first place, the concern, and then the activity, and the urgency. Even if you only briefly read this verse one or two times as we did this afternoon, even if that's all you did, what immediately jumps out to you probably is that this man Job has a spiritual concern for the souls of his children. Here's a man who has many thoughts about and is concerned about the sin the possibility that his children might sin. Before I become very specific and tell you exactly what it was that Job was concerned with, I want to zoom out a moment and let's make a couple of general remarks about this concern Job had with his children. And... For one thing, just generally, broadly speaking now, I want you to notice a couple things about Job himself. 
Job was a godly man. That's right out of the gate. What you find in this book, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. God is working by His grace and Spirit in this man. And only because God is working in him does he even have any concern about the sin of his children. So you have to understand that only as God is working in him are the things that we're going to hear about Job true. He not only has, as the spiritual man he is, a concern about his own soul, he has that, And I'm sure Job thought a lot about his own sin, but he has many thoughts also about the souls of his children and the sins that they may commit. In other words, Job was not selfish, thinking only of himself, but also of others. And I think there already, people of God, there's something to learn from Job. If you are a Christian father, one in whom... Christ is working by His grace and Holy Spirit. That's the only possibility for the concern that you're going to have for people in your family, for one thing. But if Christ lives in you, you don't have thoughts only about your own soul. That's always inevitably going to spill out into your home. And these little people, or these a little bigger people, these children that you have in your household too. You'll have a concern also for their soul. What I'd also like you to notice about Job is that he's a father. A father is sensitive to the things going on, perhaps, with his children. He didn't leave this to his wife. Job had a wife, we know that, There was a mother for these children. But Job did not dump this all on her. Well, I've got my 7,000 sheep, my 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. I'm one of the greatest men of the East. I don't have time to deal with these domestic things. Here, wife, here, mother, you take care of the children and look after them spiritually. He didn't do that. Although he had, you can be sure, a very great business that he had to tend to, he took his calling as a spiritual head in his home seriously. And he carried it out. And if he was to have a sensitivity to what was going on in the hearts of his children, if he was to have that, and he did, He had to have been a man who was involved with his children too. You might say a a hands-on father with them in the home, caring for them in the home, knowing their personalities, their tendencies, the things that they may have been tempted with. And only if he's a man really with his children is he going to have a concern for them and know what to be concerned about them for spiritually. And is there... Such a rich word to us even from that. I know things get busy, men. And in the sophisticated world that we live in, to try to keep up and work and work and work, it's a lot. It's a lot of hours. But we must be men who are involved with our families and take that spiritual headship very seriously. And if we are to be concerned spiritually for our children, then we have to be men who are with them and involved with them, who really know them, if we're to be sensitive to what's going on in their hearts. So that generally, something about Job. Another general comment I want to make from our text is when Job had a concern for the sin of his children. Is it striking to you? His children 
we're not doing anything outrightly wicked. It's not like he had a son, maybe a daughter, maybe a three children that were walking in some impenitent way of sin and it was obvious and they're just living a life of debauchery. It wasn't anything like that. His children are just living a normal, regular life and they're also living as godly children. And yet, he's so sensitive to the potential that they might be sinning. I think that's striking. I do, I do want to give you a little glimpse into the life that his children were living at this time. You get that in verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Now, it seems here that there was a, a circuit if you will. Each of the seven sons would take their turn on their appointed day to have their brothers over and also their sisters to come to their house and to eat and to drink with them. So you have one son of Job and he invites his brothers and sisters on his appointed day to come to his house and they eat and drink. And then you have another son and he invites his siblings over to his house on his appointed day and they eat and they drink. So a circuit like that. Understand that this feast that they're at, this eating and drinking, was not a wild, riotous drinking party that they were having time after time. If that were the case, Job would be concerned with a whole lot more than he's concerned with here the text would call out their drunkenness, but it doesn't say anything about intoxication or being drunk. Job doesn't have anything to say about that, which would indicate, sure, they have food. Sure, they have something to drink, but it's in moderation, and they're simply celebrating the life that God had given them and enjoying His gifts. These children are simply living a normal life godly life with a celebration every now and then. Job's children were not living in some terrible evil to spark this concern that he has about them. They're simply living a normal life, and even though that's the case, he's still sensitive to their sin. A lot of times nowadays, beloved, parents wait to have a real spiritual concern for their children until one or two or three of them are walking on some terrible path. Maybe they don't really care so much, that's really not an emphasis in their home, this whole matter of sin and the souls of the children, but then when they get a little bit older, maybe to teenagers, and you have a couple living not the way that they should, and it's really obvious, then father and mother all of a sudden get concerned. Wow, we, we need to think about their sin now and their soul. It ought not to be that we wait for our children to walk in a wayward way before we get concerned about their sin. It ought to be already when they're living not a sinless life, but the normal Christian godly life. Having the concern then already. One other general matter that I want to point out to you as to the when he has this concern. This all happens before the great crisis hits in Job's life. Like I said, you probably associate the book of Job, and I do too, with the trial that hit him and then you've, you've got his children, they're dead, and then the wife and what she says, and unsupportive friends throughout the book. All these things hit him like so many storms. But that's the end of chapter 1. We're not there yet. We're at the beginning of chapter 1, before all this hits. And yet, even though he's not in a troubled part of his life, a crisis and trials, 
already know he has these spiritual concerns for his sons and daughters. It doesn't take a trial to drive Job to be spiritual. And then I want to say today, sometimes it takes something that God sends into our life to really bring us to our spiritual senses. Some big trial or crisis so that we're sitting, you might say, at the bottom of that hole and then we say, ah, I've been so lax. I need to be thinking about the souls of my children more. And it took this big trial in my life that God sent me to drive me to this. But it ought not to be that God needs to bring crisis into our life to bring us to realize these things. Let us, parents, in the calm, smooth sailing waters, already then have these sensitivities to the sins of our children. That generally, what exactly then is the sin that Job is concerned with? What precisely now? We read at the end of verse 5, For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Let's just take that first part a moment. It may be that my children have sinned. This is what Job is thinking about. You've heard this definition for sin before, and this is the word in the original here. Sin is a missing of the mark. And it wasn't as if Job is concerned that maybe his children were aiming at this target of God's glory, and they tilted their bow and arrow, as it were, just a little bit, and it was a near miss. But they really tried to hit the target. Not that. But Job's concern is that they may have taken their bow and arrow, as it were, and turned completely the other way and shot at some other target. That they may have sinned, missed the mark. Job, what did we learn about him already? Man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil as this man who fears God. He wants God's glory. It's everything to him that those bows and arrows in the lives of his children are pointed at that target of God's glory. And when even the potential that they're pointed the other way is a grief to him, he can hardly even bear that thought because he wants the glory of God. Did you notice the text speaks here of potential sin. It may be that my sons have sinned. Now that's quite something. He's not even saying, I have actual evidence that they've done something. He doesn't even have that. It may have been. Perhaps it could have been. And there you see just how sensitive Job really is to this monstrous reality that we call sin. He's concerned even with potentialities. Now, what exactly though does Job have in mind? What is this missing of the mark or this sin? Well, he specifies that a little later in verse 5. It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. This missing of the mark is what he's thinking about, that they may have cursed God in their hearts. Job wanted to go right here. It wasn't as if he was unconcerned with outward behavior. I'm sure Job would address that if he saw it. But he wants to go below the stem and leaves and plant above the soil, right down into the soil to the root system itself. He doesn't want to concern himself so much with the water spraying out, but with the fountain 
out of which the water sprays. He goes down to the middle of his children, to their heart. Heart. And that's why, by the way, he says, perhaps they sin. He can't see inside their heart. That's hidden to him. That they may, and this really gets to Job's concern, that they may have cursed God in their hearts. That word curse can have the idea in some passages of saying goodbye to someone, bidding farewell to them, goodbye, farewell to you. And then you get from that the idea of renouncing or dismissing And that's the sense in which you ought to understand curse here. Job was concerned that in the hearts of his children, they may have been unmindful, forgetful of God. So here they are, eating and drinking, legitimate activity. They're just celebrating together on these appointed days. They're eating and they're drinking and they've got their brothers and their sisters and they're together in this house and they're having a good time and there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But Job thinks it may be that in the middle of all this feasting and this good time that they might forget God in it. That they might be unmindful of the one who gave them all these things and their very life itself. And that the feasting and the drinking and the having a good time and enjoying life and living it might just eclipse God. That's what he's concerned about. Fathers, Do you have that sort of spiritual concern for your children? Is it so with you that God works by His grace and Spirit so that what you want is His glory and you burn with a passion for the glory of God so even the potential that your sons and daughters might be missing the target of His glory is a thing of horror to you. You can't even bear the thought of that. You're sensitive to it. Even the possibility of it. Are you concerned with what's going on in their heart? I know. It's so easy to focus on the outward behavior of children. And I'm not saying... We don't address outward behavior. That has its place, certainly. But outward behavior is often the thing that we zero in on because that's the thing that embarrasses us when we're in public in front of other people. And the outward behavior is the thing that's ringing in our ears or so offensive to our eyes, it's just right there, and we think that's the thing that has to be dealt with. But we must never stop there, but all the way down to the root system of that plant thinking about the hearts of our children. That they may have cursed God there. They've got toys. And they have screens. And they eat and they drink. And they have birthday parties and they have Christmas parties. And the concern is when they're eating and drinking and when they're with their friends and they're doing homework and they're playing with their toys and they've got this screen in front of them in the middle of it all, those things not wrong in themselves, but that they might not be thinking of God who's given them these things, that they might have from time to time forgotten Him and their mind may have drifted from Him And in all the busyness of their life with everything our children are involved in, from homework to sports to games to toys to friends, that all these things 
might eclipse God in their vision. Do you have a concern for that? Job did. Job, having that burden within himself and thinking these things, is busy with a couple activities. Verse 5, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. The first activity that Job was busy with, having the spiritual concern for his sons and daughters, is he sanctified them, says the text. Sanctify means to set apart. I'm going to try to make it as visual as possible. When you set something apart, you take it away from something and you bring it toward something else. And when it says that Job sanctified his children, it means that they were set apart from the feasting and everyday enjoyment of life and the things that they were doing in those days and that they were set toward the burnt offerings that Job was about to offer. Let me put it in a little different way. That they are sanctified means that they are in a spiritual frame of mind, that they were prepared or ready for the burnt offerings that Job was going to make. They must not be focusing in their thoughts on the enjoyments and the eating and drinking and family members and conversations, all those things, but they must be focusing with their thoughts on the worship that is about to take place, the burnt offerings, thinking about their sin and their need for a sacrifice for their sin. They must be prepared before they come to the sacrifice. Now, exactly what Job said or what he did in the sanctifying process, we don't know that because the Bible doesn't tell us but it must have been that he stood before his children and he set before them the need to be separated from all these things and to be devoted to this idea of sacrifice. You have to understand, of course, the Lord alone is the one who sanctifies Job's children, but he does use means and he did use Job to sanctify them. Now, having sanctified them, the children now ready in a spiritual frame of mind, now they come to the burnt offerings. Job, you remember the introduction? Job lived before all the Levitical priesthood came about. In the days of Moses, this whole system was set up so that you would have priests making sacrifices. One offering would be for this kind of sin and another offering for that kind of sin. A whole system or structure was set up. But Job lives before that time. Remember, probably during the time of Abraham. And at this stage in history, before that Levitical priesthood, if you were a God-fearing father in the home, you would be the priest. And as a part of your priestly duty, like Job here, you would offer burnt offerings for your children. So that's the historical context here, and that's what Job is functioning as a priest in his family. He offers a burnt offering. I'd like you to try to imagine this for a moment, beloved, in your mind. There's an animal, and the animal is slain. It's killed, and it has blood coming out. And then 
that animal is placed on top of an altar with fire on it, and the entire body of that animal is just being singed and burned with those flames of fire. And the smoke and the flames are ascending up into the air. That must have been quite something to smell and to look at. Pretty graphic. And the text says that Job offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So, son number one comes here, and Job takes that animal, kills it, it's bleeding, puts it on the fiery altar, and the flames and smoke ascend. Son number two, he takes another animal, kills it, puts it on the altar, and it burns, and the smoke and flames are rising in the air. And he did that for each of his children. And I take that to mean the daughters as well. When they saw each of those sons and daughters, when they saw the blood and the death and the flames, and they smelled it. That was a reminder to those children of how serious sin really is. And that it requires a sacrifice. And essentially what Job is doing here is he is confessing with his children these sins. And when they saw the blood and the death and they saw the flames rising up into the air, that was also a reminder to those children, there has to be an atonement, a covering for sin. It must be. And that can only come when there's a bloody sacrifice. And sin can only be forgiven on the basis of that bloody sacrifice which has made atonement for your sin. That's what they are reminded of. And what Job essentially is doing here with his children is seeking forgiveness for the sake of a sacrifice. But in all that, Job well understood, and I'm sure he taught his children this, don't focus on this furry animal with blood running down its side being burned up on this altar this children is just a picture and you must look ahead he directed his children to look ahead where he saw by faith the sacrifice the job couldn't have understood that in all of its details he saw christ in only a shadowy way but he knew the promise And he believed it and that this was but a picture for him and his children. That sacrifice he must have taught them, that is the one that's necessary for your sin. That's the atonement that you need. And your sins forgiven for the sake of that burnt offering. Today, Two, we teach our children the seriousness of their sin. And today, too, we tell them about how Christ's sacrifice is necessary because of their sin and how it can be forgiven only on the basis of that sacrifice. And today, too, we teach them to seek, confess their sins and to seek forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we actually take our children and with them we confess sin and seek forgiveness for Christ's sake. That goes on today too. And all of what I just said there happens when we pray with our sons and daughters. And that, people of God, is where I want to center the application here. Praying with our children. Do you do that, fathers? And maybe the thing you can think about now is when you come home or walk up from your home office and it's five or six o'clock in the evening and you sit with your family around the table 
and you eat and you have a good time together, but then at the end you have family worship. I hope you do that. Open the Word. Go to God in prayer. But it's that time of prayer with your children, perhaps, that you can especially think about now. While you're at the table, before you even get to that point of worship, and especially prayer, you sanctify your children. You set before them, parents, by your word and example, before you ever get to that point of family worship, you set before them the need to set aside everything that's been going on in the day. Don't think, children, now of your homework and of your friends and your toys and what you were just playing with before supper. Children, set all of those things aside and think upon, focus upon what we're about to do. Concentrate on your sin and your need for a sacrifice. We too, in a certain way, sanctify our children. The Lord sanctifies them, but He does use us as means. They must be prepared, spiritual frame of mind, before family worship. And then, when they're in that frame of mind, Father, pray in front of your children and with them Father in heaven, if we have forgotten Thee today, if in the midst of our play and our school and everything going on, we've been unmindful of Thee at moments and these things have eclipsed, we confess these sins to Thee and we ask Thee to forgive us for Jesus' sake on the basis of that sacrifice. Fathers, when you as a spiritual leader in your home, pray that or something like that with your children. You're not only praying with them, but you're teaching them how deadly serious sin is and how necessary Christ's sacrifice is and that forgiveness can only be on that basis. You're teaching them how important it is to speak to the Lord, I've sinned, to confess that and to seek forgiveness for Christ's sake. That is what a spiritual leader in the home does. Fathers, pray with your children. And when you do it, don't be general and vague. Father, we pray for this family, these children... No. We pray for this child and this child and this child and this child. Say their names in your prayer as Job offered according to the number of each of his children. And maybe take them before they go to bed and kneel down with them on the floor with each individual child knowing this one's personality, tendencies, and temptations, and wrap your arm around that child and pray with them, confessing sin and asking forgiveness. You see, as Job did it, so also we. It's personal. It's also urgent. And Job showed just how urgent this was that he functioned as a priest in his family. When the text says, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning. This was the first thing on Job's mind when the time came. He's not going to go out to his cattle. He's not going to talk to his servants. How's business going? He gets up early. And this is what he does. He has a spiritual priority in his life and it cannot wait. And Job shows the urgency of this all too. The text does actually. When it says at the end, thus did Job continually, time after time after time, and the beginning of verse 5 reads this way, when the days of their feasting were gone about. You could translate that 
when days of feasting had completed their circuit, like I said, these seven sons probably had some sort of circuit that they followed when they had people over to their house to feast. And when each circuit was completed, whenever that may have been and with whatever frequency, Job offered burnt offerings, which is just to say regularly, continually. And when you consider how busy he was and what a business he had, that's quite something. Is there that urgency with me and with you, Father in the home? A zeal to pray with your children and a regularity in these prayers even every single day. And then I say, but I've got a lot to do in the morning. And I say, I've got a lot to do during the day. But then I look at Job and I say, this has got to be the priority in my life. And I will, by the grace of God, be resolved to make time for this every day. So regular, in fact that Job was even doing this for his adult children. They had their own houses. And there's a word to grandpas and grandmas here. Spiritual concern for children and grandchildren doesn't end when they move out of the house. Pray with them when you have opportunity as adults too. And then don't miss father and mother too. The gospel for you. Ah, uh, Pastor, I have failed. I've not prayed with my children like I should have. My prayers have often been hollow shells and just sort of a ritual after supper if we have devotions. And I haven't had that sort of regularity and, and urgency and I really haven't thought about the hearts of my children like I should have. And then I say with you, Father, me too. And that same sacrifice to which you point your children is your comfort too. Confess your sins to the Lord. And look, that sacrifice seeking forgiveness for your sin. A daunting task, no doubt about it, by the power of that burnt offering of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of His cross, you go forward in thanks for the bleeding Savior, praying with teaching your children. Amen. Heavenly Father, give to us that urgency. Grant unto us that regularity. We confess our sins unto Thee too and our failures. Forgive us, Father, for the sake of Christ who offered Himself for us as that burnt offering. And Father, strengthen us to be men, especially, who are Christian fathers and role models before our children in the home. Men who are ourselves given to prayer and who pray with our sons and daughters. Give to us, Father, a concern for their hearts and a sensitivity to sin. In Jesus' name, Amen.